Hi, it's William with Boxer 2 Valve, and this is part one of a new series that we're going to be working on re revolving around the BMW R80 RT mono lever and the conversion we're going to do. I'm a big fan of the mono lever models. I always have been. This is really the model that was brand new when I first kind of got involved in BMW motorcycles professionally in the mid 80s. And um, this is the bike that I like to ride the most. This is a bike I picked up quite a number of years ago. It started out as an R80 standard, and um, what happened was it had the S fairing put on at time of sale, low bars, which is pretty cool, and the fork gaiters. So it turned it into kind of an upright, naked bike into a real sporty machine. That's how I picked it up. And since then, the only other things I've done to the bike are um, install a Siebenrock 1000cc kit, which really made a big difference, really woke the bike up and a deep oil sump to raise the capacity of the oil up to 3.5 liters. Um, it's a really fun bike to ride. It's a really viable modern bike, even though it's 35 years old. You can go out and, and kind of tear it up on one of these things. I'm um, going to show you some of the things about the mono lever that make it unique when compared to all the bikes from 84 and prior. So starting at the front, you've got tubeless wheels, an 18 inch front wheel in, as opposed to a 19 and the tubeless aspect of it is great it's a lot easier to install and remove the tires and also if you do get a flat or pick up a nail on the road instead of having to mess with a tube just a plug and you're back on the road very very cool setup also the brakes were increased in diameter from 260 millimeters to 275 millimeters uh, also a new pattern brake still the 38 millimeter calipers optionally the bike also came some, some of the models also came with a 40 millimeter caliper and a single disc, but this is one of the two disc models, luckily. The forks were increased from 36 millimeters to 38 millimeters in diameter. There's, there's an integrated fork brace, which is really cool. So the front suspension is actually really good. The steering's precise because of the 18 inch wheel and the handling is, is superb on one of these bikes. The next thing moving on into the engine is of course with the later model like this, you're getting the brakeless ignition system, so no points to mess with. The latest version alternator of the period, which is uh, pretty good, I'd say. Newer version starter from Vallejo, those were really very good too. Um, the engine itself, not much change there, but it does have the um, the later clutch mechanism, of course, from, which was introduced in 81 and later. And also the uh, valve train is much improved over previous models. It has uh, probably the perfected um, rocker arm system for BMWs on a bike like this. Moving on to the gearbox, you've got the latest in shift technology, the newest shift mechanism. So the, shift, the, so the shifting is nice and crisp and clean. Also the adjustable shift linkage on this model, and then you've got some other really practical things. Has, the ignition system has a dual coil, really nice uh, coil setup. We'll get into that, all that later. And the seat, I find the seat really comfortable. I've got a couple of these, and really hundreds of miles on the seat, even at my advanced age, no big deal. Um, under the seat, some really practical storage options. Got nice big toolkit here. In the back, the seat hinges are improved from previously. Uh, pretty pretty sit, cool setup. Now, there were a couple of different bag mount options if you want saddlebags. This one's got the loops on it, so I can run the Krauser bags, kind of the classic look that goes really well with the motorcycle. Sometimes you'll also see the plastic mounts for the um, integral bags. That was an optional thing, or they were sold in tandem, basically, at the time. So you'll see them one way and also the other. Another really big improvement with these mono lever models that I like is the center stand and the side stand. This is now a really solid mechanism. I've really rarely ever seen any of these fail for any reason. It's a nice wide stand that supports the bike beautifully. And also the side stand is strong and relatively easy to deploy. So that's, a, I think, a nice thing about these bikes too. The foot pegs are real comfy and they're almost symmetrical as opposed to the staggered ones of the earlier models and it's a it's a really fun bike to ride on the rear you've also got tubeless of course a uh, tubeless wheel and the rear bolts um, to remove the wheel so there's no rear wheel bearings no 
wheel bearings to adjust. All the, the bearings are inside of the final drive. Same with the front wheel. Um, the bearings are sealed. They're easily removed and replaced without having to make any adjustments. So the maintenance aspect of it over a long term is much improved over the previous models just because of newer technology at the time. So what are negatives about the model lever? Maybe there are a few. The styling is a choice you have to make. You know, I, I think it looks pretty cool, but the sort of different tail section, front fender, um, the side covers, different than the previous models, but actually I think they're very timeless and classic. But that's a subjective opinion. The fuel tank's a little bit smaller than previous models, um, partially because it's shaped a little bit shorter and also because on the right-hand side, the, the capacity is a little bit smaller because there has to be room for all the electronics that are largely on the right-hand side of the frame. The exhaust system's a little bit difficult to deal with. There's some seals that you need to be replaced whenever you take the exhaust apart and uh, getting it apart and getting it back together several times is, can be a bit of an issue. But other than that, I think that they're really awesome machines. And so what we're going to do now is show you what is on the plan for the next uh, series of videos here. Coming right up. So recently we picked up this R80RT here locally in North Carolina and it's a 1985, it's a very early production R80RT. Now if you have an R80 like the red one we just looked at or R65, just a standard bike, that's something that is really cool because there weren't really that many of those imported into the United States back in those days because it was right at the time when the K75 and the K100 were being launched and BMW was putting a lot of effort into those models. So there weren't really a lot of boxers brought in. There were quite a few RTs, however, because it was the only touring bike really available. So there were a lot of R80 RTs, R80, R100 RTs brought in. And um, as far as a touring bike goes, this is a great fairing. I mean, it's a little bit complicated by today's standards in a way, and it, it, it's, it, but it was really the, the, the cool touring fairing back in the day. It's kind of lost its, in my opinion anyway, its usefulness as a touring bike because of the way that the traffic situations have changed and there's, you know, even an R1100 RT is probably a better touring bike nowadays than, uh, than, th than this thing is. But all the more reason to do what we're going to do on this and that is to sort of make it like that red bike. We're going to take the fairing off, put some low bars on it, make it really sleek, put an S fairing on there and yeah, it's a perfect candidate for that. So this bike is in pretty okay condition. It runs. It's got about 85,000 miles on it, something like that. And it's been repainted. Looks like the color of the K bikes, of the K100 of the, uh, of the time. We're gonna repaint the bike. Um, it's got a Corbin seat on it. We're also, we're given the stock original seat, which is cool. That's gonna go back on, as well as the original grab handle. We got that too with the bike. So when we bought the bike, you know, I looked at it, okay, it ran. In fact, the guy rode it over to show it to us. So that's always a step in the right direction. But a couple things you always want to look at on a, a, a mono lever like this is just generally if, you know, check the suspension, make sure that the forks go up and down nicely so there's nothing in tension, nothing binding there. Um, check the instruments, especially the uh, voltmeter and clock. If they work, that's a real plus because they're very, very expensive. They're not really available anymore, so you're, they're hard to find. Um, double check, make sure that there's no big dents in the tank here. A lot of times the fairing, if the bike ever fell over, at this point here and here, it'll, it'll put a dent in the tank. Something to look at. Also, look for any leaks, anything like that. Of course, these are the kind of things you're going to probably go through and fix. We certainly are on this bike. Even if it did leak, that sure, certainly wouldn't be a reason not to pick up the bike. Look at the rear wheel. Now this one here actually has a lot of movement in here. It's got a lot of play. So I can see the, the change in this gap right here and I can also feel the movement. Now this is really no big deal. We can fix it. It just needs, it's just a matter of shimming, taking the final drive apart. Not, not a big problem, but it's something to look at. You wouldn't want to ride the bike for a really long time with this. It's something that needs to be addressed. Also, the exhaust system is, is pretty rusted, uh, fairly common, and especially on the other side, but 
you want to look at that too. These exhausts do rust out. So that's another issue that this bike has. But that's not so bad. It's, it's, it's a fun bike to ride. It's going to be a really exciting project. So what I'm going to do next is, because it does run, I'm going to take it out and get it up to fully operating temperature and then bring it back in the shop. And the first thing we're going to do is just drain all the fluids, which needs to be done when the engine is totally hot. I'm going to show the best way that I think to do that. And that'll be a good starting point. Then we'll start taking the motorcycle apart and uh, having a lot of fun with this one. So I'm gonna get, get my gear on and go for a ride. Now it's time to take this bike out and warm it up. And this will be the last ride of this motorcycle as an RT. Next time I ride it, it's gonna be an S, a very custom one at that. Okay, well, the bike's nice and warm. I took it for a nice ride. It runs great, actually. This is not exactly the coolest day of the year either, so I think it's pretty well warmed up. Before changing the oil, though, I really like to use this Liquid Molly engine flush. What this does is it go, it's an additive that goes in the hot oil and takes all the deposits and so on in the oil and brings them into suspension so that when you drain the oil, they, they flush out. So it's added when the engine's at operating temperature like it is now, and then you let the engine run for about 10 minutes and then drain the oil. So I'm going to do that right now, first thing. Pour the entire contents of the can of engine flush into the engine and then put the dipstick back in and start the motor. Okay, so I'm gonna go and let that do its thing. In the meantime, I'm gonna get out of these hot, <laughs> this gear and put my work clothes back on and then we'll keep going. All right, this guy's fresh off the road and oh, nice and, nice and hot, which is the way we want it. Put the liquid molly engine flush in there so the, we should be ready to just drain the oil. So before you drain the oil, always loosen and sort of remove or at least put to the side the dipstick so that you you want to let air in so that the oil really flushes out in one stream then you'll need a series of pans now if you don't have a lift you can put the bike on the center stand but since i do have a lift i have the center stand up it's just a lot easier to deal with actually getting in underneath when you don't have that stand to deal with but either way is fine if you have to put on the center stand then do that so first thing to start with is the, let's get the oil out of there first thing. Break that drain plug loose. And before we start dealing with too much oil, I'm gonna get some gloves on. Okay. So that's good to get that nice hot oil out of there. You can really smell the, uh, the liquid molly engine flush in there. And uh, once we get the motor apart, we'll see what kind of results that gave us. Okay, so straight away, I'm gonna move over to the other side to take the filter off. Okay, once the bolts are out, just remove the cover here and quite a lot of oil still comes out of there. And what also came out of there is a shim and an O-ring and, and a gasket. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. And then pull the filter out. Let that drain off. Now always, when you get in here and pull the filter out, always look and make sure that the rubber seals came out also. Now look at that. There's a rubber seal missing, but it fell off in the oil pan. But still, they do come off. That just shows you what can happen. So if that seal were left inside and you go put the new oil filter in, you'll potentially crush the oil filter and lose oil pressure, which would be terrible. I'm going to move along and get the rest of the oils draining and then come in and talk about the filter, like I said, in just a moment. Gearbox is the next one we're going to drain. 
So first I would like to loosen the filler plug and back it out a bit like so. And then get down underneath there with a socket, 19 millimeter. And that's an extension to get right up inside there and break that loose. Okay, just at the same time as I remove the drain plug, remove the filler plug too, just before you let the oil out, and that allows that to vent and for the oil to flow f freely out of the gearbox, like so. And then have a look at the drain plug. It'll tell you a lot about the condition of the gearbox. If there's a big pile of uh, metal shavings on there, that's something to be concerned of. This one looks surprisingly clean, like really good. So the gearbox did shift really well, but that's further indication to me that, it's further indication to me that the gearbox is probably in pretty good shape. Okay, so now the, that's draining nicely. Move over to the final drive. Next is to drain the final drive oils. You've got the swing arm oil and the final drive. I like using these uh, graduated beakers for this guy, kind of see how much is coming out. And then, because I know how much you used to go in. It should be 350 in the final drive and 150 cc's in the swing arm. So you can see if indeed that's what comes out. Plus the way that they have the little filler or the little pour spout kind of goes in nicely so that the drips don't go onto the side of the tire. So the top one is a vent and you might as well pull it out even though it does vent but just to make sure that it vents thoroughly and also that's where you're going to fill the oil back in later on so that can come right out first of all and then remove the drain plug. That doesn't look so good at all, but um, hmm. <laughs> maybe that's why it's loose. So we're good thing we're doing this. Now we're going to take out the swing arm oil, and there's a 17 millimeter wrench size plug on top. Luckily, the threads are in good shape on this one. They're not; they haven't been over tightened. So that's a that's an awesome thing. That's oftentimes the case. Let's see how the bottom one is. Oh, that one's good too. Awesome. That's a good sign. So the color of the oil looks kind of strange, but I don't know, you never know what that is. It could be uh, some additive that was added to the final drive and swing arm oil. That's not a bad thing. That's something I'm gonna do too. I'm gonna use the liquid molly additive. So mostly I'm looking at here, it's actually pretty cool because the, the, the um, the volumes are not too far off, so it had enough oil. Also, once again, the uh, final drive plug doesn't have a bunch of metal hanging off of it, which is a great sign too. So that's, that's all good stuff. Okay, so now that that's all draining and I got the pressure off me of uh, getting it drained while it's at operating temperature, uh, go back to the discussion about these, um, the filter and the O-rings and all that kind of stuff. Okay, another uh, cool thing about the monolever models that we didn't talk about earlier is that they made a significantly uh, positive improvement to the oil filter cavity. On the older bikes up to 84, the, the, there's like a uh, sleeve in here, like a cylinder where the filter fits into. It's all one outside diameter and it left a little bit of a gap around the edge and that's why they supplied always this shim to lay against that, that groove with the O-ring on top. And that shim was very important to give the O-ring a solid base to lay upon. Without the shim, it could get sucked in, you would lose oil pressure. A lot of horror stories about that. On the model lever, they flared the end of that canister. So there is no gap around the outside, which is really cool. Now, when actually, I'm old enough to where I did 600 mile services on these bikes when they came in for the first time. So 
I was draining the factory filled oil and filter. And there was no gasket, there was no shim, it was just the O-ring, that's all. That's all that's needed to seal here. You can, you can just put the O-ring in, that's the way they used to do it. However, when you get a filter kit, it comes with a new shim and gasket. And so there's absolutely no harm in using those parts. I put the gasket in just in case, you know, any oil is extra uh, protection against weepage. And then consider the shim actually a, an equal thickness approximately to the gasket so that the proper amount of tension is still on the O-ring. So go ahead, I would go ahead and use them. But anyway, just a little background on, on that and the, the further coolness of the model lever. All right, as far as refilling goes, I just always start with the oil filter first because that's all done draining. Everything else is still kind of dripping out. But now I'm going to go ahead and put the new filter in. So here's new, the uh, new filter. Now the other alternative that you have is a solid one-piece filter that we also offer. Instead of having the hinge here, it's just a solid one. Now that filter is available. Um, and it doesn't come with any seals, so you need to order the gaskets, O-ring, shim, et cetera, extra. Whereas the kit comes with the gasket, the O-ring, the shim, and the drain plug seal included. The advantage to the, the hinge is if the engine has engine protection bars, you can kind of snake it in past. On a bike like this without them, either way is fine, but it is a little easier just to get that fed right in like so. Push it all the way in, and of course, you've already made sure that the old seals are not in there. So a lot of times, sometimes these gaskets are kind of a little bit bent from being in the package, but it's not a problem. Just straighten out a little bit. And then if you lay it on there and stick the O-ring on next, it kind of holds the gasket in place pretty well, like so. And then, yeah, we talked about the chim. What the heck, let's put it on there. Um, so make sure it doesn't fall off and get cocked in there, but you can either lay it on there or actually, even better yet, set it up inside. And here again, it has no real function other than to equalize the thickness of the gasket on this model. Okay, I'm going to put the oil drain plug back in. This is the original oil drain plug. This is actually what I am going to put in. This is the magnetic drain plug that we offer. It's really visually identical to the original, but it has a magnet on there, a very strong one. And, you know, there's a magnet in the final drive. There's a magnet in the gearbox, none in the engine oil. Not that there's a lot of metal that could occur in there, but it sure is nice when you change the oil to see if anything's going on. And so that's something we offer, and that's what's going in here. So new drain plug seal and and it goes. Now taking the old crush rings off of the plugs and they're pretty mashed down. Man, gotta use some pliers to get them off. That's what happens with these crush rings sometimes is they get mashed down and perhaps they get over tightened too. Now when we took it all these, when I took these plugs out, we we're able to realize that the threads are in really good shape. So this is lucky on this bike, but we want to make sure it stays that way. So the choice of seal ring is something, oh, this had two of them on there, no wonder. It's all these little mysteries that you uncover when you dig into a bike that you never worked on before. All right, the, uh, in case you get it mixed up or you don't keep track of it, there's, there's two different magnetic drain plugs that come out when you do what we just did. One has a bigger magnet, one has a smaller magnet. Easy enough to understand which is which. The bigger magnet goes in the gearbox, the smaller magnet goes in the final drive. It corresponds to the amount of fluid actually that's in there. Uh, so but these both look pretty good. I'm just going to clean them up really quick in the solvent tank, get all the grip off of them and reinstall them. All right, all cleaned up now. Uh, regarding seal rings, there's a few different things on the market available. There's the aluminum seal rings, which are actually just fine. This is really common. They, they squish nicely and without requiring a lot of torque to seal. There's also uh, copper. 
These are great too, obviously, but on these older bikes, it's been my experience that it takes a little bit more torque to get these copper crush rings or seal rings to compress and can put a little more tension on the threads than are absolutely necessary. So I'd much prefer the aluminum over the solid copper. However, there's a third option, which is even better, and that's these uh, fiber-filled crush washers. These are uh, very similar to the ones that we had 30 plus years ago, where it's a basically a thin piece of copper, like a, wrapped around like a donut with a, some fiber fill inside. So the copper is super thin, it crushes down without a lot of torque, and it forms a really nice seal without having to tighten the screws too much. Puts a nice tension on it so that the bolt will come loose. It's just like pretty slick. And so these are what I'm recommending to use on, on the two valve twins in general, just because we want to keep them, make them last. Every time you take those threads out or they take those plugs out, you're working those threads a little bit more. And these are going to be a little bit easier on them with a long-term goal in mind. So you notice that there's a little split on the uh, crush washer. I always put the split against the case, opposite the head of the bolt. Snug it down, and then when you go to tighten it, you'll notice that it has a sort of progressive feel to it. It just gets a little bit tighter all the time, and just once you've more or less compressed it, stop. There's no reason to crank it down. Same here on the swing arm. The swing arm fill is actually the most sort of susceptible to getting pulled out. Okay, that's all, all it takes. Now I'm gonna put the drain plug back into the gearbox using one of these uh, crush washers. Go up there and get that started. It's not so hot anymore, it's cooled down a bit. Okay, so now all the drain plugs are back in the bike. And normally what I would do at this point is put oil back in. But because this is the very beginning of a really very lengthy process, we're going to be taking the final drive apart, maybe the gearbox, we'll see. And so it'd be pointless to put oil in right now because I'm done riding the bike for the, for the moment. But if you were to put oil in, I just want to go over how you would do that. In, in the final drive, swing arm and the gearbox, you're going to want to use a good quality high point gear oil, 85W90. And for that, we highly recommend this Liquamali gear oil. It's really awesome. It meets all the specs, actually exceeds specs for BMW, and it's perfect for these um, airheads. To put that in, you want to put in a measured quantity of oil on this final drive. Now, there is a plug on the back here for checking the level. But I would recommend just leave that in there and don't rely on that at all. You're better off putting in exactly 350 cc's of gear oil into the final drive. Using something like this, of course, you clean it really well, could thoroughly get all the old oil out of there. Pour in 350 cc's exactly and pour that in the top into the vent hole and then put the plug back in. For the swing arm, the amount is on this model 150 cc's. Here again, measure that out, pour it in carefully. It's kind of hard to get in there. A syringe works really well. We have those, and that are, you know, they're e relatively easy to get, and the syringe can make it easier to get that amount of measured oil into the uh, swing arm area. This is the oil that we recommend. And then as far as the gearbox is concerned, the amount is about 900, uh, 850 cc's. You want to fill it to the bottom of the fill hole on the side and maybe even a little bit above that and then her quickly put the fill plug back in. And so for the whole thing, you'll need about 1.5 liters of gear oil, roughly, to complete the, the job. Um, the other thing I really highly recommend and have great experience with is the Liquid Molly Gearbox oil additive. This is a Molly Bendum MSO2 additive that works wonders on these gearboxes and final drives. I had a bike which had this terrible whine and uh, I thought for sure I'd have to take it apart and do some repairs to it, but I added this first and the whine more or less went away. And I had the same experience with uh, my 
Volkswagen Bug in the, in the transfer case. So it's really an amazing stuff. So this small tube that we offer is enough for just about the perfect amount to do an oil change on one of these bikes. So you put about three quarters of it approximately into the gearbox and the remaining part into the final drive. It has probably not as much benefit. Well, I might lubricate the U-joints a little bit. A little bit in there wouldn't hurt either, but you kind of like evenly split it up based on the oil capacities. And it's an awesome thing to use when you're servicing your bike for it to last a long time. And so that's about it, gear oils. And we're ready to take on this project now. Next video, that's all we're gonna do today. But we'll do next time is actually start taking things apart and more or less laying out the scope of work that we need to do, getting some parts organized, things like that. And it's gonna be a lot of fun. So a lot of the products that we've talked about are in the, in the video below or in the, uh, in the description below. And if you have any other questions, comments or anything, you can add those, we'll add, answer as often as we can. And make sure you subscribe to our YouTube video so you can be alerted every time that um, a new video comes out. Now, intentions, our intentions are really good with this one that we're gonna try to keep on a, on a good schedule and, and have them coming out frequently. So you'll wanna make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Keep the shiny side up and enjoy your boxer and we'll talk to you next time. This is William from Boxer 2 Valve.